Hello, I'm Ray C., WEIM Fitchburg. It was November 1941, just weeks before Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, December 7. Fitchburg was thriving. More than 10,000 people were employed, the highest number since before the Great Depression. The Armistice Day Parade began at Morin Square with over 700 marchers, but with a new note of grimness shadowing this usually solemn occasion. There were new war dead to honor on this Armistice Day as the sailors of the Reuben James, the first U.S. destroyer sunk by German torpedoes on October 31, had just recently given their lives for their country. Sentinel headlines read, This Armistice Day is dedicated to the sailors of the Reuben James who presumably have gone to meet the dead heroes of the Argonne and the Chateau Terry, a reference to the dead of World War I. But there was also a reason to celebrate, as Fitchburg's son, Gerald Delisle, one of the sailors on the Reuben James, was rescued at sea uninjured. Veterans of the Great War marched in Fitchburg that day, joined by Italian-American, Canadian, and other Allied war vets. The veterans were joined by the veterans' auxiliaries, Company H 21st Infantry of the Massachusetts State Guard, as well as the Boy and Girl Scouts and their drum corps and bands. All were led by a contingent of Fitchburg police and Grand Marshal Arthur J. Isabel, along with Fitchburg Mayor Alfred Willicott. The parade continued up Fitchburg's main street from Morin Square to its destination on the Upper Common to place wreaths in memory of World War veterans at the foot of the monument sculpted by Fitchburg's own Herbert Adams. WEIM Radio, established just one month before, in October of 1941, was there to broadcast the speeches given by veterans of the Great War. One such veteran, A. Andre Gelinas, spoke prophetically of the impending war to come. Quote, I need not be a prophet to tell you that our country has now undertaken a course that is fraught with all the dangers of war. Although we hate the prospect, we must face it and prepare ourselves in every way for the forthcoming horrors. These horrors were already underway in Europe and in Asia. 
But despite all the bad news, normal life went on. 1941 was a momentous year for both Fitchburg, the country, and the world. FDR was in his second term and preparing the country for war, despite the many non-interventionists in Congress. In the era when television was in its infancy, the movies boomed. Hollywood could barely produce the films fast enough and box office receipts soared. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones average topped 135. By 1941, the Axis powers were well on their way to world dominion. By November 8th, Hitler had inflicted nearly 10 million casualties on the Russians. As winter came, just nine miles from the Kremlin, Hitler halted the Moscow offensive with losses of 750,000 Axis men. Silk stockings are rationed. The government limited fabric length, banished pleats, prohibited more than one pocket, and eliminated trim. Civilian women followed the look of service women with gray flannel suits and low-heeled shoes. The best picture of the year was How Green Was My Valley. Gary Cooper and Joan Fontaine were named as best actors. Just a few weeks after this movie was made, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and the Congress declared war on Japan and all the Axis powers. Life would never be the same. Fitchburg from Rollstone Hill belied the energy that was flowing in the mills and factories along the Nashua River. Employment for skilled labor was at an all-time high in the city, and munitions for England's war efforts were manufactured in the city at Independent Lock Company. Mayor Alfred Willicott had just been re-elected on the nonpartisan party ticket, beating out independent progressive Philip J. Lynch. Election returns were broadcast by WEIM from the old Oyster Bar restaurant, a favorite Fitchburg hangout at the corner of Pritchard and Main Streets. The second son of English immigrants, Alfred Willicott was re-elected for a fourth term in November of 1941 by an overwhelming majority. During his administration, he was credited with developing the John Fitch Highway, building a system of water mains encircling the city, along with the first railroad underpass for pedestrians. Another project of Willicott's was the building of the Fitchburg Airport, his proudest achievement. A lifelong Republican, Mayor Willicott gave weekly radio talks on station WEIM on Sunday nights and went on to serve the city as mayor until 1947. Fitchburg's main street was its hub, the center of life in the city. Traffic flowed both ways past the stalwart Rollstone Boulder and Friday nights on main street was the place to be. The street was alive with businesses of every kind.
Movies were by far the most popular entertainment. Downtown movie theaters included the Cummings on Blossom Street, the Fitchburg, Lyric and Universal Theaters on Main Street, and Shays on Day Street. Movies changed twice a week, and some of the theaters, like the Lyric, also offered stage shows. Matinee admission was 10 cents for a triple feature. The variety of movies shown was staggering. The five downtown theaters showed 20 new movies a week. Fitchburg Savings Bank, then in the French Mansard style building across the street from its modern building today, was one of the six banks on Main Street. Others included Worcester North, Safety Fund National Bank, Fidelity Cooperative, Fitchburg Cooperative, and Worcester County Trust Company. The old depot, located at the beginning of Main Street, was owned by the Boston and Main Railroad Company. As many as 70 trains stopped here each day. Whether disembarking from a train at the depot, or a bus or taxi, Fitchburg's Main Street was the place to be. You could pay your utility bill at the Fitchburg Gas and Electric Light, have a sweet treat at Bailey's, buy flowers at Ritter's, have lunch at Brooks Counter, pick up a prescription at Rexall's, a newspaper at L.O. West's, have a car repaired at the Ivor Johnson Garage, watch a movie at the Lyric, pick up a chicken for dinner at Brockelman's, buy clothes at Nichols and Frost, a pair of shoes at Goodwin's, and have them shined by George Stangus, all the while walking along Fitchburg's Main Street. You could even repair your flat tire on Main Street, as this poor guy is doing. There were 106 manufacturing establishments in the city and over 10,000 employees earning wages in excess of $14 million. Principal industries in Fitchburg in 1941 were paper, saws, machine knives, furniture, machine tools, engines, lathes, firearms, bicycles, motor trucks, paper machinery, bag filling machinery, cotton, worsted yarns, woolens, rayons, and duck cloth. Celluloid goods, shoes, children's garments, boilers, locks, trousers, ladies' handbags, luggage, and granite quarry products. Skilled labor was scarce and in demand. With over a thousand employees each, Crocker Burbank and Simon Saw were the largest employers. Fitchburg Yarn and Independent Lock Company each had between 500 and 1,000 employees. As the war heated up, defense contracts fueled the boom. Gillass Shoe Company received an order for 60,000 pairs of Army Dress Oxfords. And and Mills had large orders for flannel, Independent Lock made gun fuses for the Army, and Cowdery Machine was building 75mm artillery pieces. Leading paper manufacturers included Crocker Burbank, Fitchburg Paper, and Dijon, along with Maury Paper Mill Supply Company. Fitchburg Yarn, the Watetic Spinning Mills, and American Woolen were the leading manufacturers of cotton, woolen yarn, and cloth in the city. To serve the needs of Fitchburg's population of 41,824, there were over 600 retail establishments in the city, 39 grocery stores, 19 furniture stores, 22 automotive dealers, 54 filling stations, 54 barber shops, and 38 beauty parlors. One could buy a better Buick, invest a little more and get a Pontiac, settle for a Studebaker, or glide around town in a Chevrolet Aero sedan, not to mention Cadillacs and Oldsmobiles. On the downside, during 1941, there were 250 auto accidents in Fitchburg, with 288 injured and three killed. With employment at an all-time high, easy credit terms were always available. National defense work had turned Fitchburg's economy around. The Fitchburg Airport was developed under the urging of Mayor Willicott with WPA help. Munitions in the city were manufactured in November 1941 at the Independent Lock Company on Daniel Street in Cleghorn. Education was an important priority for Fitchburg citizens. 
The new modern high school building was recently dedicated after the 1937 fire destroyed the 19th century structure. Fitchburg could boast of two junior highs, B.F. Brown on Academy Street and Teachers College Junior High on Pearl Street, where students were taught by faculty and students from Fitchburg State College. There were two vocational and continuation schools, one for boys located on Broad Street and one for girls located on Pleasant. 14 grammar schools served a student population of 4,592, spread around the city's many neighborhoods on Academy, Beekman, Day, North, South, School, Laurel, Lunenburg, Goodrich, Water, Ashburnham, and Cascade Streets, and Highland Avenue. Emphasis in the classrooms was placed on students developing a greater appreciation for the American way of life, in contrast to the totalitarianism that was sweeping the world in 1941. School administrators wrote, We have tried to impress upon the pupils in school that America is still the land of hope, the hope that those ideals so gallantly fought for and won by our forefathers may always be available for them, the hope of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of worship, of equality in government and education. These hopes must be carefully safeguarded and maintained by each generation and with the profound faith that they will and must survive for the sake of our American way of life. To show off their patriotism, Fitchburg school children began a penny collection to help pay for the new battleship USS Massachusetts. At the opening of the Fitchburg public schools in the fall of 1941, Teachers met to cooperate with the development of a national defense to learn about incendiary bombs, fire protection and use of fire pumps, identification and effects of poisonous gases, first aid for such gases, blackout principles, choice of shelters, and knowledge of the duties of blackout wardens. This information was also published in pamphlet form and distributed to teachers in all Fitchburg schools. Radio station BFB, Benjamin Franklin Brown reflected America's love affair with the radio as a means of entertainment and information. Like television today, people in Fitchburg relied on radio for their news of the day, their weather, and entertainment. It was their connection to the world. School curriculum placed emphasis on developing the mind as well as the body, and students enjoyed outdoor calisthenics and sporting games when the weather permitted. Students at the junior and high school levels studied the practical arts and machine shop to prepare themselves for careers in Fitchburg's paper and machine mills. Young women were encouraged to study domestic arts such as cooking and sewing in preparation for their future as wives and mothers. The majority of the young women by the time of graduation had already chosen their careers as secretaries, nurses, teachers, hairdressers, or wives and mothers. Young men were either attending college or planning a life of work in the city's many mills. Fitchburg State Teachers College, founded in 1894, was a valuable source of teachers and nurses. The school, later to be renamed Fitchburg State College, provided an important career stepping stone for many Fitchburg residents. Children innocently played on the playgrounds, saluted the flag with outstretched arms and a show of patriotism, and enjoyed the American way of life that would be challenged within a few short weeks when the U.S. entered into the Second World War on December 8, 1941. Fitchburg offered worshipers a plethora of denominations and houses of worship. 
The freedom to worship was a basic tenet of the American way of life, and Sunday morning in Fitchburg found residents in droves exercising that right. Women and girls were shrouded in hats, while men removed their hats upon entering the church. Sunday was a family day in the city where Massachusetts blue laws were followed. In general, men and women did not work on that day, and retail stores were not open. Sunday was a day of rest to be enjoyed with family and friends, a day to relax and enjoy the fruits of their labors. Lighting up a cigarette on the steps of the churches signified the power that smoking held over the population. Smoking was popularized in the movies, in the newspapers, and the radio. According to popular cigarette advertisements, only men and women who smoked experienced life to the fullest. Fitchburg proudly showed off its courthouse, built in a French chateau style in the late 19th century. It was an effort to quell Fitchburg's desire to create its own county, separate from Worcester. The city was also proud of its public yards and its modern water treatment plant. The fleet of city trucks, some possibly manufactured by Netco on Lunenburg Street, rolled by the camera in a parade of machinery. Patrolman Ernest Newry, winner of the New England Police Revolvers League shooting contest, showed off the skill he used to win best revolver shot in New England. In 1941, city patrolman got a raise in pay to $5.65 per day. Police were not the only ones who enjoyed target shooting. At the shooting range, men and boys were preparing for the annual turkey shoot. Fitchburg's Armory, located on Wallace Avenue, first established as the home of the Massachusetts Volunteer Militia and now Company H, Massachusetts National Guard, hosted a dance on Saturday night with music played by Tony Brown and his orchestra. The local Red Cross, with assistance by the local Civil Defense Office, efficiently showed off its motor unit and canteen in a demonstration on Fitchburg's Upper Common. Victims were loaded and unloaded on stretchers from the ambulance. Those who attended the demonstration were rewarded with refreshments from the canteen. The ladies of the Red Cross also assisted in disaster preparedness by making bandages for the future victims of disasters and wars. Burbank Hospital, located on the site of the old Nichols Farm, high on a hill overlooking Fitchburg, treated the sick from the city and surrounding communities. Burbank Hospital was a quasi-municipal hospital in that it operated under a self-perpetuating board of 15 trustees and three city officials. The Burbank Hospital was fully approved by the Joint Commission on Hospital Accreditation. Its School of Nursing offered both a three-year nurses training course and a four-and-a-half-year combined nursing and college course with Fitchburg State Teachers College. The hospital was also approved for residency training of young doctors in surgery and pathology. It maintained 20 clinics in the outpatient department, including clinics for maternal and infant care. Fitchburg General Hospital, located on Summer Street, has 50 beds and was privately owned and controlled. The Visiting Nurse Association, known as the VNA, was organized in the city in 1913, when a group of civic-minded people recognized the need for nursing care for the poor of the city. The objective of the VNA was to teach health by right living render service to those unable to afford a trained nurse in the home, reduce the infant mortality rate, and instruct mothers as to the proper care and feeding of babies and children. These happy and healthy babies are part of the Well Baby Clinics, which were started by the VNA in 1920. Located at 16 Hartwell Street in the downtown, this VNA office offered over 3,000 mothers and babies a chance for a healthy and happy life. Today, these babies are approaching 60 years of age.
fleet of cars awaits the nurses of the VNA as they begin their day of home visits. With over a hundred associations and clubs in Fitchburg, citizens could choose one of their liking. For example, the Kiwanis Club, which sponsored the original production of this film, was a fraternal organization formed in 1923, whose goal was to build better communities, encourage the daily living of the Golden Rule, and to cooperate in creating high idealism which makes possible the increase of righteousness, justice, patriotism, and goodwill. We save the best for last. Red Raider football games played at Crocker Field. People had to apply for tickets to the hottest football contest in town, the fitchburg Lemonster Thanksgiving game, 58 years old in 1941. However, the film crew did not stick around to film this rivalry. In all probability, this is the fitchburg worcester North game played at Crocker Field on November 17, 1941 in which Fitchburg routed their opponent 38 to nothing. During home games, football fans would sit on the roofs of houses surrounding Crocker Field and have cookouts during the game. By the way, Fitchburg also decisively beat Lemonster that year on Turkey Day, 14-6. Life was good in Fitchburg that week in November of 1941 when a moment in time was captured forever. <laughs> 